Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Well, I'm, uh, I'm a little more relaxed than usual, which means... Something god awful is going to happen, but you know, for the moment, I'll I'll take it. I won't say I, I deserve it because you know, deserves got nothing to do with it. Uh, to quote Will Money, but it's a good feeling. Um, last week's board meeting went fine. The client who thought about having me fly down to, or flying me down to North Carolina for their sales meeting decided, yeah, we can do that next year, and uh, and that means I'm not really going anywhere. Just a couple of driving trips and. Uh, and I get to breathe a little. And next week's going to be Thanksgiving here in the U.S. I do have a show lined up for, for next week. And I'm hoping to get a couple more recorded during that stretch. Um, so, was, you know, maybe I won't be running around in December particularly. And I can get to work on a, um, well, the depressing year-end uh, podcast project I have in mind. I'll, I'll give you more on that as it uh, as it fails to progress. But for now, let us get to this week's show, since it features one of my all-time favorite guests, Philip Lopate. Uh, he has a new book out from New York Review Books called A Year and a Day, An Experiment in Essays. And it collects the essays that Philip wrote for the American Scholars website in 2016 as a weekly blog. Like any collection of his writing, it's an absolute joy to read. Uh, Philip is the master of the personal essay, and his collections are among some of my favorite contemporary writing. I've got a well, I've got a whole shelf of, of Philip's books, which I'll probably post a picture of in the the show notes for this one. But what makes this collection unique, a, a year and a day, is that the blog assignment gave Philip the restriction of a weekly deadline. And that leads him to take on some different topics than usual and to balance the the beautifully wrought sentences one is accustomed to from reading his stuff with the exigencies of, of you know, the send button. And on top of that, the 2016 election provided some uh, uh, world wrecking topics for, for Philip to deal with. So he doesn't always muster his his joyous sense of humor and the, the the face of all that but he still brings the um he brings the philip game uh, he brings the the analytical mind and the passion and the beautiful writing and like i say it's balanced with what it means to do this every week and that makes this book a compulsive read uh the the shorter form uh, of each piece the immediacy of the prose it's just irresistible i took this one with me on the trip to barcelona a couple of weeks ago and even at my worst, after day one of the conference when I was a burned out wreck, I just sat down with the last 30 or 40 pages of this one and it just, it let me breathe. It let me see a different world. Um, it made me feel better. Now, Philip tackles a pretty wide range of subjects in this book, but anyone who's read his essays, you know that the subject is Philip. And I mean that in the best way, like like Montaigne, uh, who's both of our heroes, um, he explores the universe as seen through his eyes, but he relates it to the reader like a friend. Now, uh, Philip's been on the show three times before, and uh, with each conversation, you know, we have some emails back and forth, but we've literally never talked, talked outside of these podcasts. I, um, I feel more of a sense of of what someone can achieve in words and of how the essay can make us feel less alone in the world, even when the particulars don't match up, I guess, especially then, because his work, his essays remind you not just to see the world, but to try to see what someone else sees. If you get me, we talk about it during the episode, so you'll, you'll get it. 
But A Year and a Day really is a, a wonder of a book. Uh, it brings us Philip in a different mode and fixed in a certain time, that 2016 time frame, but with the same writerly mind. And I was overjoyed when I saw New York Review Books was bringing this out because, frankly, I'll take any opportunity to, to talk with Philip. But what was funny was this conversation, I didn't even realize, uh, was 10 years after the first time we talked. And it brought us into some new territory. I wonder if I went back and listened to, to all four of these, you know, who the two men were who were sitting at the table each time. The third time uh, having to be remote uh, dur during the middle of the lockdowns. But um, anyway, that's all I'm going to say about that. Go read A Year and a Day. It's out now from New York Review Books. Go get all of, of Philip's essay collections as well as the collections that he's edited, like The Art of the Personal Essay and the three American essay collections that we'll talk about. Now, as caveats go, um, his cat meows a few times. Uh, his wife and daughter talk upstairs. Also, his daughter came downstairs at one point. You're going to hear the steps, uh, but out of respect for her, I can't include that that part of the conversation. But suffice to say, we had a very funny exchange where she came in while she was headed out somewhere, and um, well, we all talked for a little bit. Anyway, that's not in this show. Sorry, but I'll put in a little break. You'll know where it takes place. Now, here's Philip's bio from the book. Philip Lopate is the author of the essay collections Against Joie de Vivre, Bachelorhood, Being with Children, Portrait of My Body, and Totally, Tenderly, Tragically, and of the novels The Rug Merchant and Confessions of a Summer. He has edited the anthologies The Art of the Personal Essay, The Glorious American Essay, The Golden Age of the American Essay, and The Contemporary American Essay. His most recent books are Portrait Inside My Head, To Show and to Tell, and A Mother's Tale. And his new book is A Year and a Day, An Experiment in Essays. And now, the 2023 Virtual Memories Conversation with Philip Lopate. So what was it like returning to your, your 2016 self for this book? Well, I did it during COVID. Um, I, you know, I was uh, stuck indoors and I started to, to read these blogs uh, without any intentions, you know, just, uh, uh, just for fun. Yeah. And, uh, and I thought... This stuff is pretty good, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it, it wasn't as though I had changed that much uh, between uh, 2016 and 2020. Um, but it was that I, I, I thought, you know, this could be a book. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I put it together and I, um, I took out certain pieces that I didn't like anymore. And I substituted a few pieces that I had done... Um, not for the blog, because I'm not a purist, uh, and uh, uh, and the result is a book. Yeah, but those added pieces were still from around that period, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like for instance, um, I had I had gone to China, which I wrote about in the book, yeah. and then um, one of my books was translated into Mandarin, and they asked me to uh, to write a preface. So I wrote that, hello, I'm Philip Lopate piece yeah. uh, for the Chinese, you know, uh, and then I put it in the book. Um, and then there was a piece, uh, The Enigma of Literary Renown, which I wrote um, and published in the New York Times and thought, well, this would be a good place to put that in, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it was it was the blog plus additional pieces. Um, uh, but basically, they were short pieces. And what was that blog experiment like for you? In the introduction, you talk about getting that, um, yeah. getting that invite to do this weekly blog. But tell well, me about writing that way. Initially, I had this snobbish uh, contempt for blogs, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that that many literary people did, um, and uh, just because I had this contempt for it, I thought. Perversely, well, maybe I can uh, appropriate it and push it in a different direction. Yeah. And I like this editor of the American scholar, uh, Sudipose, and so I was doing it partly for him. 
Uh, and for me, the the um, the risk was tremendous because every week I had to come out with something. Uh, now you know what I go through, except I get to do it in conversation instead. But yeah, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, every week I had to turn in something, which meant that I had to seize on whatever was uh, floating around me at that moment. Um, and so sometimes it was uh, that I had gone to a museum and seen an Agnes Martin show or going to a jazz club. Uh, and sometimes it was thinking about the past. Um, so one way or another, I had to come through, you know, um, and that, that was a challenge. And that was a that was a fun challenge, it turns out. Um, you know, it, 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 it was frightening, but it was also interesting, you know, um, it, it 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 put me you know, uh, put me on my, on my, um, my druthers to, you know, am I really an essayist who can write about anything? Yeah. You know? Um, and, you know, I mentioned Montaigne several times and to some degree I was working off of a Montaigne model because a lot of the titles are things, um, uh, like Montaigne's, you know, of popularity, of friendship, so on. Um, so I, I, I thought, okay, can I do this, you know? Um, and so for me, they were, each one was an essay. Now, don't forget, um, as you know, because you're familiar with my work, in the past I had also written short essays as well as long essays. So this was not a, something completely new for me. Um, I never thought I would change my style because this was a blog. It's too late for me to change my style. <laughs> Certainly. Yeah. yeah. So um, I thought, okay, I'm going to write these as essays, no matter what we call it, blog and so on. They, they're basically short essays. Yeah. The uh, you've done short in the past, but this is short with a weekly deadline. Yes, and you know my line that I've used for years is the columnist curse. We saw it with some literary writers trying to blog earlier than yours, like in the early 2000s, yeah. where it turned out they really needed editors. Yes, um, and they thought the immediacy was great, and then they would end up basically inadvertently praising Hitler somehow. And, and that always turned into the problem of, I have to keep churning out material. Well, blabbing, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And it always goes wrong. Yeah. Um, so being able to sustain, not just to do short, but to do short 52 times a year or, you know, weekly. Yeah. 48 uh, times it was. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I was aware of some of the, um, the hazards of, of blogs in the past um, by other writers, uh, including just, you know, um, blabbing on, you know. Um, and so uh, I wasn't going to do that, you know. I was still going to uh, to make every sentence count and to build towards something. Yeah. So I had that structure in my mind, you know, which is basically the structure of the essay where you you plant nodes of tension in the essay um, and, and, and you, you work through the contradictions and you come, come out somewhere. Again, just the, the challenge of pulling that off on a, a regular basis is what, you know, I've, I've really wondered if it affected you in terms of writing or, you know, whether, again, you you just had a practice, you figured out something over the course of a week and, and managed to put it together. Um, I would sort of I'll try to complete a piece in two days. Yeah. So let's say the first day was a, um, was the first draft, and then I would um, fuss with it and try to make it a little cleaner. And it works. Uh, the, many of the pieces feel finished, well-crafted. Um, and I couldn't tell how much of that was the immediate thing versus, oh, I went back a few years later and kind of cleaned this or no, that no, up. But I didn't yeah, actually, they all feel like they're... they're. I didn't actually edit them uh, for this book. You know, I edited them uh, during the week that I was uh, submitting them, you know. Uh, so, yeah, the idea was to create this kind of intimate conversational quality. So... Some of my friends have said it was like, you know, sitting next to me and hearing, you know, having yeah. a beer, you know, and, and, and so I like that idea of the, the, the conversational um, and, and, and that kind of uh, intimate contact. Um, and and that, that has a lot to do with, um, with, uh, with honesty, let's say. Um, you know, it's funny because... The conversational doesn't mean that I, that the writing should get sloppy. Yeah. The writing still has to be tight. Um, but what makes it conversational is um, the the um, the push pull um, 
of a, of, of a dress, let's say, or working, working with an audience, you know, um, talking to an audience. Yeah. So, you know, you can't, you know, when you actually uh, see a speech transcribed, um, it always seems um, vague and, and um, you know, if you look at, let's say, um, you know, the, the Pentagon Papers or any kind of uh, document that's, that's transcribed, you know, um, it's vague, it's abstract. I couldn't do any of that. Yeah. I wanted it conversational, but I wanted it specific. It's true. And I've had episodes transcribed. I clean them up and, you know, not just the ums and ahs, but some of the, the, the digressions tend to, to, well, like now, have no exact point and, and veer off in, in wrong directions where you can find those essences still yeah. and, and kind of make it a coherent experience for the reader. Right. But again, that's transcription versus actually bringing your voice as the, the sole one that, that goes in. But there was a point, and I, I didn't know uh, if it was the, again, the columnist curse or the weekly thing where you, you mentioned, uh, I'm running out of things to say. Uh, let's see, I, I feel like I've, I've you know, done my life work as a writer. And I wasn't sure if that was just despair from the blog or, you know, the, the greater sense of who you were in 2016 and, and how you looked at a, what writing has meant to you and what you've done with it. Well, I certainly... Uh... Uh, prove that that wasn't wasn't the case. Yeah, you know? that's um, I think it was just one of those um, <laughs> down weeks, quasi <laughs> quasi suicidal things that writers say, like you know, I can't do this anymore. You know, this is too hard. You know, uh, I'm running out of things to say. Yeah, but you know, uh, for me, um, curiosity has always sustained me. Yeah. So you know, it's because I am curious about a lot of things that I do find new subject matter. Mm. There's a, a another line in the book where you also say uh, the the writer in me has merged with the private self to the extent I can no longer see the difference between the two, and that's a that's a thing I've run into with a couple of really really good artists mm. and uh, artists in any field, including right. writing, uh, where there is that sense for you the the, the personal revelation is the professional artwork, I guess, what you produce. Um, it'll be weird to ask, but when did you find that you were did that I integrated? Did my writing? Yeah, yeah, that well, you were on the page. You know, you know um, I've said so many things. Um, and I hate quoting people like that, but, you know, they seem like very meaningful. No, I, I've yeah. said so many things in, 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 in my, in my um, autobiographical writing about myself, um, that in a way, I, I, it's hard for me to, to see the difference between uh, me on the page and me walking around, you know. Um, I mean, they're not exactly the same. For instance, uh, I'm still working um, behind a persona or a mask, you know. Even um, the mask is, is, is fairly close to me, but, but it is a mask, you know. Um, and, uh, and certainly... Uh, uh, me on the page uh, is more articulate than, than me uh, in regular life, you know, so that, for instance, when I wake up in the morning, um, I'm, I'm not very chatty. Um, and uh, sometimes my, my wife and daughter say, you know, speak up, you know, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I'm always, I'm always um, um, willing to be articulate on the page. So I'm not exactly the same, but I'm, I, I'm, I'm fairly close at this point. And I also think um, of my books as additive in the sense that, um, that war women kept, you know, adding to Leaves of Grass or that Proust kept adding to Remembrance of Things Past, that essentially um, each of these books should be seen as, um, as, as a stage and you put them all together and then you have the complete work. Maybe that's an excuse for the flaws in the individual books. Like, <laughs> hey, you know, um, you know, don't take it so seriously. You have to see the whole picture. Yeah, I got better. Yeah, mm -hmm. although it puts me in mind of Montaigne. Mm -hmm. um, the I, I told you from our, our first conversation, I worked my way through the entirety of the essays one right. by one years and years ago before the podcast. Now I have this instead. But one of the things in the edition I had was the. The revisions and yes. going back in and, and changing and I, a, I B and C yeah. yeah and that's a very it's a different approach than you have or it seems 
sometimes you revisit stories, but there's not a, you know, this is the revised version of Philip. Right, right. Yeah, no, I, I, I basically leave them alone. And, um, you know, I'm not going to be like Yeats, who, who rewrote his letters, books of, of his correspondence. He said, well, I can do better than yeah. that. You know? um, <laughs> I'm not going to do that, you know. Um, so, you know, I'm basically, I'm basically saying this, this is a record of what I was thinking and being at this moment, you know. And that 2016 self, do you see it as, I mean, the world changed significantly. The and you, changed, yeah. you write about, you know, your your tension with that, your fight with whether or not to write about Trump and, and right. all this. But do you see that, that 2016 self as I pretty see, much 2023 self? I do. I mean, yeah. I, I attempted in this book to, to do a self-portrait by circling around aspects of myself. So, for instance... Um, you know, I've always liked, like certain things, baseball, jazz, um, uh, painting, movies, um, and, and, um, you know, puzzled about domestic life. Um, so that's who I am, you know? Yeah. Uh, so if I write a piece in 2016 about Dinah Washington, I'm probably still going to think the same way about Dinah Washington, um, you know, about John Coltrane or whatever. Um, so, yeah, it's, I, I, I mean, you have to understand at this point, I'm not, I'm not going to change that much. Yeah, understood. Oh, tennis, I mean, I'm still playing tennis. In my f early 50s, mm -hmm. I discovered different aspects of my life and, and I took up art after turning 50 and discovered, right. oh, I can draw and I can actually visualize things that I never imagined I, I could. Um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to keep those, you know, that, that sense of unfolding in life well, around as long as I can. But you're, yeah. you're a kid, you know, and I'm, I'm about to turn 80. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In a few weeks. So, um, so, you know, I'm astonished that I'm about to turn 80 because most people don't think of me as that old. Um, which may be that they're, they're reflecting on my immaturity. Um, but <laughs> in any case, um, uh, I'm wondering if I can use this as an, as an excuse card. Like, hey, what do you expect? I'm 80, you know, <laughs> like, can't expect me to do anything else. Um, shovel snow, forget it, you know? Yeah. So, <laughs> so It's always yeah. good having built-in excuses like that. Exactly, I'm, I'm, exactly. So, yeah, so I'm not going to change that much. And partly what, 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 the, what the, the whole form of the prison essay does for me uh, is becomes uh, an opportunity to to look at my limitations because mm -hmm. uh, you know this is a fair amount of of self deprecation in, in these pieces. I think self mockery is the self mockery. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and um, uh, I think that I think that uh, that's that's one of the, um, the 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 draws of this kind of writing. You know, that you think about all the things that that you can't cannot do. You know, um, and 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 that becomes you know. I mean, you can't just brag in this form, you know, because yeah. that would be insufferable, you know. So you, so I suppose talking about your limitations is a kind of reverse bragging. Um, Anti vanity, vanity is how I, I put it in this uh, yeah. in my notes. But yeah. yeah, it's like no, no, I'm not vain. By the way, here's my life in front of you. That's, yeah, that's you know. exactly. So, but I mean, essentially, um, you know. I don't think I'm I'm that important or important, and I, but I want to uh, make the reader feel that he or she is not alone in their uh, puzzlements and their uh, attempts to understand uh, uh, when they come up against a you know um, a wall, let's say, you know. And that sense of, we'll say, fulfillment as far as what you've done. You mentioned um, a, a modest. Destiny modestly fulfilled. I, yes. I think. Yes. Do you feel that sense that you've you've accomplished? I do. I mean, I think. Wanted. I think yeah. when I when I when I look back at this book, one of the things that 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 that, that comes to me is that um, it's a record of somebody who's fairly contented with how he's turned up. Yeah. You know, and and when you think about many many memoirs that are written now. Um, they 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 tend to be about um about trauma and they tend to be about um um identity confusions and so on um and um that's not this you know yeah. um 
I, you know, I think, okay, this is who I turned out to be, you know, with all my with all my sillinesses and limitations, and it's not so bad, you know. So actually, um, um, strange as it seems, it's, it's it's the record of a happy man. Yeah, I was going to ask in that respect, and, and it ties into the last conversation we had, um, which I'll get to in a moment, but how the how the essay has changed from what you've seen. You know, you, you've taught, you mm-hmm. you review, you write. Um, how have how has the approach to the personal essay uh, change in your your experience? I guess. Well, certainly, um, in some of the ways that I've just mentioned, which is uh, often um, younger writers feel that they they have to uh, assert some wound, you know, um, some wound or some. Uh, uh, um, some victimization, you might say. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, you know, I I am very grateful for the unhappy child that I had. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I just did a show with uh, Adam Sisman, who did the biography of John Le Carre, right. and I, I'm going to mangle however Le Carre put it, but. Um, his take was your writer's career. It's all a bank. The, the childhood is just the, the bank that you're drawing on. Yes, throughout. yes, that's been said by a, by a lot of people. Yeah. And so, so I'm, I'm, so, so I'm, I have nothing against that, you know. Um, and and um, when I was when I was a kid, I didn't even know there was another option, you know. So, yeah. um, uh, in any case, uh, you know, I've I've um, struggled with with some of the earlier uh, problems and and. And, and work through them to some degree. Um, and the, the essay has changed a lot. I mean, I think that, I think that there's more of, a, of an attempt now to put the reader in the midst of the confusion, in the midst of the, the raw feeling than they used to be. In other words, uh, uh, it used to be assumed that an, that an essayist would provide a perspective, detachment, and to some degree, distance from the experience that he or she was relating, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and more recently, um, you know, the, it's it started to feel like the essayist was um, was asking the reader to say, "Isn't this isn't this maelstrom what you're going through also?" You know, yeah. uh, so that's a different that's a different experience. Myself, um, I am very drawn to the analytical. Mm-hmm. Um, so no matter where I start, I'm going to analyze something, you know, um, which means I'm going to try to apply some uh, perspective and detachment. Um, and I don't really want to um, feel sorry for myself because I don't feel sorry for myself. Um, you, you, by the way, have saved me from so many self-pitying personal essays mm-hmm. I could have written with just the advice from the introduction of the personal essay, because the amount of grievances I could write about my father right. would just be getting your own back. And it's yeah. the, oh, well, Philip warned me that's the most boring thing you can do in an essay, so I don't have to write any of this. Yeah, I can find some way of making something positive instead. So. Exactly, yeah. Or well, something interesting, intriguing, you know. I mean, for me also... I'm, I'm drawn to the comic, and if there's any possibility for me to to smile or laugh at something that has happened, I, I'm going to go with it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and 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 a lot of the writers who have meant the most to me have been have been essentially comic writers. So, um, so yeah, that's that's that that is definitely not um, something that's that's being done a lot now, you know. Mm-hmm. And when you're teaching, or we're teaching. And, you know, students were submitting work along the, those yeah. sorts of more immediate lines. But, How do you work with those? Or were you able to, to kind of give them the, well, yeah, like, I would go a little, you know, you know like step some, back a little bit. But, yeah, yeah, like, you know, a woman submits a piece in which she, she, she says only good things about her father and hates her mother, you know. Yeah. And, you know, so here we have the eatable model, you know. And I'm saying, mm, let's look at this a little bit. You know, let's look at... Uh, maybe there's some something else, you know, going on, you know. Um, so let's take a typical example in teaching. Okay. Um, a, a mother tells her daughter um, that she should watch that she's putting on a lot of weight. Maybe she should think about, you know, changing her diet or something like that. And the daughter thinks this is 
horrific. This is an invasion of privacy. This is, um, you know, um, body shaming or body shaming. Yeah. Okay, exactly. So, um, so I'm not saying, yeah, the mother's right and the daughter's wrong. I'm saying, let's let's think about it a little bit, and you know, because I am a parent, and so if you're a parent, you're always grappling with the question of. Uh, what, what is my responsibility here? Should I should I warn my child about something? You know, um, or is this going to hurt them more? You know, um, so I just try to complicate um, psychologically the situation that the student is talking about because a lot of times uh, my students uh, were writing good sentences. It wasn't the craft part of it; mm -hmm. it was the psychological part of it that was a problem. Uh, they weren't they weren't digging uh, deeply enough, you know, yeah. or they were. They would, um, they would, you know, extracting revenge, let's say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I will say just before getting here, my, my brother texted me out of the blue with the question of as neglectful and damaging as our father was, do you think his father was better or worse to him? And no. I, I, I didn't even tell him I was coming here for this conversation, no. but I was like, I had not put it in that frame before. Yeah. I doubt he's able to tell us now, you know, exactly what was damaging about his own dad, but because yeah. I chalk everything up to dad's mother. But, you know, that was one of those, I think what you're getting at, and it's it's one of the great, um, it's the human condition, not just seeing from your own eyes. Yes, exactly. You know, just, just learning to, to see how somebody else sees you or sees their own experiences exactly. in the world. And, like, for instance, um, you know, I try to tell my students, don't just think about your parent in terms of um, his or her relationship to you, but think about them before they had a child. They, they, they you know, they, they, they may have had dreams. They may have, they had a whole existence, you know, that's not just tied to their relationship to you. Mm -hmm. So that's part of it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And that's life lessons beyond writing itself. Um, it's just trying to learn how to see the world outside of your own view. Exactly. Speaking of, uh, in this book, how did your wife... And and child feel about you including them in, in the essays in quite the way you did when you talk about domestic life and and there's nothing damaging damaging but you know how comfortable are they with, with they the were subject? uncomfortable yeah uh, I had not shown them uh, this book uh, before it was published um, you could ask me why but essentially you know I thought I like it I'll stand by it this is what this is the book yeah. Uh, so then they started to really get fearful, you know, and say, you know, like, what did you write about us, you know? And um, they, you know, uh, at first they were, they thought it was going to be a disaster, you know. Mm -hmm. And then they, and then I said, look, you want to read the manuscript? Here it is. So then they read the manuscript and they said, mm, it's not so bad, you know. <laughs> You've um, done worse. <laughs> and then, yeah, exactly. And um, and um, I thought that I had written lovingly about them. Um to some degree, uh, uh, they they felt that I I had not dealt um, given a rounded enough portrait of them, you know. Yeah. So on the one hand, they didn't want me to write about them, and the other hand, they wanted me to write more about them, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it, it feels like it's the 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 uh, shortcomings of just that form that you have to to be really concise in this form. So. Yeah. Some of domestic life, I, I can understand. This is not the book in which I am doing these full-length portraits yeah, of my wife Yeah, the deep exploration of... Uh, this, I mean, yeah, yeah. to me, I wanted, I wanted um, um, domestic life to come in occasionally the way other things came in occasionally, yeah. you know? And the the workman situation, the, yeah. the there's a sort of sitcom vibe to, to a little of it, but it's understandable because you're conveying a fuller life over the course of 200 pages. Absolutely. But yeah, I, I had wondered, um, you know, especially discussing your your wife's history as a widow uh, before marrying you, luckily, and not... not right. yeah. She uh, wasn't so bothered by that. She was more yeah. bothered by the workman situation. Yeah. She thought that, <laughs> it just just was, the day-to-day -day life was... Yeah, was exactly. You know. She said, I'm not, I wasn't in love with those guys, you know, like, <laughs> I was being playful, you know. Yeah. She, 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 likes, she likes bossing around workmen, you know. Again, it's it's as as you have that that chapter on or the the essay on the lives not lived. Yeah. You know, there is the boy marrying somebody who could actually fix something in the house would have been nice, but you know, I, I, I can yeah, understand. Yeah, because I can fix nothing. You know, I'm just not very good at that. <laughs> yeah, my my wife takes everything uh, for herself when it comes to to doing most repairs. I'm like, okay, okay, yeah, okay yeah, yeah. you don't have to make me prove how inept I am doing this stuff. So yeah, that's good. Exactly. You keep a journal. I keep a journal. Um, the answer is yes, but I don't write in it every day. Okay. 
Um, so I do keep a journal and then I, I hide the journal <laughs> because in the past, my daughter has always found it, you know, <laughs> and read about it. So, but you know, I I sold my papers to uh, the Beinecke Library at Yale, yeah. and um, um, and I assume that I'm going to sell them another batch um, in a few years. Uh, and so, people can go to those journals and read them. You know, yeah. right before I submitted, the, right before I handed over the papers the first time. Um, I started just uh, reading casually in the in my past diaries, and I was shocked and appalled at the terrible things I had said about people. You know, <laughs> and then and I thought, well, I'm not going to be able to to clean these up. You know, <laughs> may uh, as well let my archivists find them afterwards. Let the archivists. I thought, you know, I, I was humble enough, humble enough to to think, yeah, nobody's going to write a biography about me right now. So let it, let the chips chips fall where they may. Yeah, but my whole line has been, unless I commit some horrendous crime, no one will read all those those journals. So I'm I'm, I'm pretty good. Exactly. Forensic biology or forensic exactly. psych. The mind of a serial killer. Yeah. yeah, as long as you don't catch on to. I mean, as long as I don't commit any horrible crimes, mm -hmm. uh, we'll, we'll be perfectly fine with this right. stuff. But yeah, I also avoid saying anything too uh, too damaging about anybody who might actually figure out my handwriting, uh, which is the other challenge for for this stuff, actually scribbling away. But when it comes to a journal, does any of that spark? Essays, or is it much more a different sort of writing, a different sort of uh, uh, um, No, some of material. it sparks essays, and yeah. sometimes what I do is that I, I write a, uh, a piece, and then I go back and see uh, what I wrote about it earlier in the mm -hmm. diaries, and if there's anything I can steal from the diaries and put into the essay. That's one of the keys to that weekly email that I put out is, what did I write about in the last couple of, oh, hey, that's something I can, I can yes. rip on for a little bit. But exactly. Is there, I mean, you talk about fulfillment as a writer. Are there forms or types of writing you wanted to, to try? I mean, you've done essays, you've done the novel and, and short pieces. But, and poetry, yes. Yeah. Um, and, and, and criticism. And screenplays, which yeah. I was not too successful at, um, though I, I did get paid for them. Um, that's a success. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I've, I've written what I wanted to write. Um, it's not like I dream of uh, of writing a Broadway play or anything like that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, you know, I found out when I was um, writing a screenplay that uh, it was like having one hand tied behind my back because... What makes the essays work so well, I think, is, is my voice on the page. And when you're writing a screenplay, it's all scaffolding. It's all, you know, yeah. um, uh, it's skeletal. Um, so I, I wasn't able to to project uh, myself or my persona into that form. You know? <clears throat> my love of movies kept me going, you know. But um, but it's such a collaborative medium also compared yeah, exactly. to... They just take what you do and, you know... Well, we'll take some of the dialogue and... Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. yeah. The other thing about age that, that came up, and I, it, I'm going to paraphrase Hitchens on this, although you, you address it uh, with, with a different phrase. Too old to make good friends? Mm. No, I mean, I can still make friends. Yeah. Um, They're all women, uh, you, you mentioned. <laughs> yeah, Generally. sometimes yeah. men. I mean, I, I yeah. you know, um, I was I was at a, a, the Telluride Film Festival a few weeks ago, and I, there was this um, Spanish filmmaker, and we really hit it off, you know? Mm. And... and um, you know, it's it's like a tribe. You meet you meet people who who have read the same things, have have liked the same art, you know, um, or they have a kind of um, uh, kindness, uh, a, a set of values that you appreciate. Um, so it's still possible to uh, to make friends. Um, what's difficult is to to keep it up, let's say, you know, yeah. and I, I strongly believe that um, I don't want the other person to to feel that they have to be the ones to make the overtures all the time, you know. So I want to be able to to contact uh, the you know the the friend yeah. regularly, and I do have a lot of friends, and and you know I think that that was very important for getting through COVID was was my friendships, you know. Yeah, how was the we, we spoke? I think like around September twenty twenty. Yeah. You know, how was the, how's your last couple of years been? How's your pandemic been? Well, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, I was diagnosed with multiple myeloma. 
Mm -hmm. And so there I had, so I had cancer essentially. Um, and um, fortunately it was a kind of uh, cancer, which if caught early in the stage one is very treatable. Yeah. So I went into treatment and treatment was not particularly arduous. You know, it was uh, taking pills and occasionally shots and stuff like that. Um, but it, it was more psychologically difficult realizing that, oh my God, you know, um, I, I am mortal. <laughs> um, and I think it was, it was even more of a, um, of a shock, um, to my, to my family, to my wife and daughter than it was. For me, I was just saying, okay, I can get through this. Or if I don't, then that, that's another story. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that was, that was, a, that was an important part of, um, of my COVID years was just um, getting to total remission, yeah. which I am now in. Um, doesn't mean it's never going to come back. It just means that now I'm in remission. Yeah, I got diagnosed with my own time bomb about a year into it. So that's been um, a watchful waiting. Gil, just come back every six months and get tested. I'm like, great. So the anxiety can just stay the entire time. But, yeah. you know, my, my health is allegedly. I'm in good. watchful waiting also for prostate. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, but one of the things that's happened is essentially that um, a lot of my friends are ill, they're dying, and um, so um, the conversation has changed a little bit, you know. Yeah. Um, that, that's become much more um, on the scene, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you reach a certain age and suddenly, uh, you know, all of your friends are having hip replacements or else they're in treatment of one kind or another, you know. Um, so... I, you know, I, I do feel um, pretty stable and I feel good about that, you know. Do you find it permeating your writing? That's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I do think it, it gives you a perspective, you know. Um, you know, one of the questions is how many more books am I going to write? Yeah. You know, um, I am, I have to admit, very pleased with this book, A Year and a Day. I like it. Mm -hmm. I like the feeling of it. Um but I'm going to keep writing, you know. Um, at the moment, strangely enough, I'm uh, I'm all involved in Washington Irving and thinking of writing a biography yeah. of Washington Irving. Really? Yeah. And uh, interested in that early stage of American literature, you know. Um, and interested in, in Irving as a character, you know. So um, there's always something to think about and write about, you know. Um, and that's that's not... That's not a personal essay project. That's a kind of a biographical project, you know, mm -hmm. where I could read a great deal, you know. If you get up to Tarrytown, I can I can go visit you if you go up. I don't know I if they have to, been. I went to Tarrytown. I, I checked out Sunnyside. Yeah. Did you have you ever no, seen? No, no, I've never gone. Oh, it's really interesting. Yeah. It's it, really interesting. It's all about forty minutes from me up in North Jersey. I can get over oh, that. Oh no, you got to go. Which we still call the Tappan Z. I'm not yeah. calling this uh, the oh, yeah. Mario Cuomo Bridge. Exactly. It, it remains a Tappan Z. It's going to be the Tappan Z forever. <laughs> yeah, no, I like I like Sunnyside a lot. I, he 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 was a man of taste, and he built this really beautiful house. <laughs> How far along on the, the project? Say, I hate asking people about what they're I'd working say on. The but, first five percent. Okay. Say. <laughs> um, when we talk about you know meeting people and making friends, to what extent do people think they know you based on I read all your your pieces and feel yeah. as though they've got the well. It's funny, you know. Um, I th a lot of times people um, assume they know me, and then it turns out that they've forgotten some very basic things about me, you know? <laughs> they should have done more research. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, like they, 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 they sense the connection with me, which is this, this voice on the page, you know? Um, but they may forget that I grew up in Brooklyn or that I'm Jewish or something like that, you know? Um, so, you know, I, I keep putting the information out, you know? Yeah. Um, and then they say, oh, yeah, I remember that, you know? So then I jog their memory, you know? Yeah. It's um, it's friendship at a distance in a sense, or by proxy. It's like we got the friendship off the page. I never actually talked to the guy. It's easier, but, yeah. It's easier to be friends like that. Yeah, yeah it's got to be weird. But the the Irving thing puts me in mind of uh, again. Our, our last conversation was around the the Great American Essay, uh, the the first installment of the three books right. that you you edited and and did the introductions for. And when we talked then, we talked a bit about Americanness. Yes, right. And 
maybe it's just this very historical moment, though I've always felt it. As a Jew, I'm, I'm first generation American. My, my parents both came over in the 60s. Do you feel, div not divided, uh, do you feel a tension between, you know, being a Jew and being an American? Not being a religious Jew, which you talk about, there's, there's, you, you gave up Torah for Montaigne as, as, <laughs> you know, I gave up Torah for, you know, the X Men and, and all the comic books of my youth. But, you know, the, the sense of, of being a Jew and being an American? I would say, um, the real division is being a New Yorker and being an American. Certainly, certainly. <laughs> you know, um, so, um, so, you know, I think of myself as a writer first, um, a New Yorker, a Jew, an American. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, now, when I did these three volumes of the American essay, that, 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 was, a, that was a major piece of work. It was a labor of love. Yeah. And in a way, um, it helped me to, to retire from teaching because I thought, okay, I'm giving people... Um, this canon, so to speak, yeah. and they can do with it what they will. You know, this was my this was my gift to future students. You know, um, all the stuff that otherwise might have been for forgotten, um, I was going to put out there. Um, so in that in that way, I actually got very interested in America. You know, and then um, I started to tease things out of it. So in a way, the Washington Irving thing is part of teasing out from the anthologies. Yeah. Um, that period, that early period, you know, mm. um, at the beginning, you know, I mean, he was the first, um, the first professional American writer. Yeah. And, and, and at the time there was just him and, uh, and, uh, James Fenimore Cooper. And then came Poe and, uh, Hawthorne and all the greats, Emerson, Thoreau, um, Melville and so on. So now I'm reading these, uh, volumes by Van Wyck. Brooks, um, The Flowering of New England, The uh, New England Indian Summer, um, and uh, The World of Washington Irving, um, and um, I'm getting deeper and deeper into um, the story of American literature. Um, so yeah, I do feel, I do feel American. Um, I mean, I think Philip Roth also had this kind of yeah. division. He was, he, he got very interested in America, and at the same time, um, and being Jewish, you know. Um, now, um, at the moment, it's it's kind of scary to be a Jew, you know. Yeah. Cause and that's what a, I was getting at. There's a lot is, of anti-Semitism. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's real, you know. Um, I think one of the reasons that I uh, am so attached to New York City is because in New York, one doesn't feel that, uh, that antagonism so much. Mm. It's much more of a Jewish city, you know. Um, but yeah, America, um, did your interest in deep American roots, how far back did that go for you? Or did it really get spurred on by this, this, uh, great essay project? Well, it's not, it, it, it went back to the Puritans Yeah, and, and, um, and in the first volume, I, I defended the Puritans as writers, you know, yeah. even though they were often, um, you know, uh, uh Degraded because they were they're seen as as puritanical. Yes, <laughs> yeah. but they were good writers. Yeah. Um, so um, yeah, I, I I I am interested in. I'm always interested in in roots. You know. So when I when I was a jazz fan, you know, I grew up in this wonderful period with um uh, with Coltrane and Monk and Mingus uh, and and um, Ornette Coleman and so on. Um, but then I started listening to um, Leslie Young and Coleman Hawkins, you know, um, you know, and, 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 and then went back to early Louis Armstrong and, uh, and Bessie Smith and so on. So I was always looking for what came before, you know. And then when I became interested in movies, um, uh, you know, I, I got very interested in the silent period, you know, the Russians, the Germans and so on. Um, so... It's, it's, it's kind of a fascination with history in the past, you know? And that was true for me even when I was a teenager. I joked that I was a middle-aged man mm -hmm. in my, at like eight years old. I mm -hmm. was, you know, already middle-aged because, yeah, exactly those, those sorts of thoughts that things extend backwards in time and you yes, really try exactly. to, to understand stuff versus, you know, the, the, the curse of the new, I, I guess. 
I want to ask you about evil. Because yes. we, we talk about, you, you write about Trump uh, against your, your better judgment, as you put right. it in, in, in the book, right. because it's being written in 2016, the election happens. Right. At the time, you seem to characterize it, him as, as evil as ignorance. Yes, evil as ignorance. That's a, that's, that's a, that's a theological perspective. Yeah. Do you hold up on that, or do you see evil as purposeful, uh, not, not just ignorant, after well, th the, the four years that went by and seven years that have gone by? Well, I think one of the things that, um, that shocked me and, and, and threatened me about Trump was that he was so uh, anti-literate, you know. He didn't read books. Yeah. Um, and, and, and all I did was read books. So, you know, uh, he, he scared me, you know, as somebody who, you know, was part of the kind of the, the post-literate age, you know. Like, is this what we're going to be dealing with, you know? Um, and, and I try not to brood about this too much, really. Yeah. But, but, you know, the sense that maybe young people are not even reading newspapers anymore, you know. Well, um, we, we saw with this crypto hedge fund guy yes. getting sentenced, his whole thing was, I don't read books, yes. Shakespeare is one-dimensional, etc. I'm like... I think you actually could have learned an awful lot <laughs> but yeah, between no, Shakespeare he, and the ancient he, Greeks. He, he, he comes right out and says that he, yeah. he, he doesn't read books. He doesn't even like movies, you know, but, but he definitely doesn't read books and doesn't, doesn't get anything from them. So there are a lot of, a lot of uh, people like that now, you know. Um, and here I am in the business of writing books, you know, yeah. um, but also reading books because um, my, my practice as a, as a writer is so much connected to my practice as a reader. Mm -hmm. You know, that, you know, I think it was so Bello who said that um, one writes out of a spirit of emulation. Yeah. So, yeah, so I'm I'm still I'm still trying to emulate the writers who I who I love. Um, so is evil ignorance um, whether I mean, certainly on one level, it's 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 ignorance of not being able to see um, the other person as human, you know. Yeah. And. Um, you know, so again, so, this goes back to the Greeks. I mean, you get Aristotle saying you, evil is is it, no one consciously performs evil acts; they're just mistaken in in the course they're pursuing. But do you believe that after after what we've seen? Well, the Greeks were very involved with the notion of of virtue. You know, as sure. everybody <clears throat> was striving for virtue. You right. know, um, so. I think that I think that a lot of people are just striving for survival, you know, um, and um, and certainly there's been a lot of pressure on young people to make as much money as possible in as short a time as possible, which is what yeah, you send make it free, it runs through did, the, the yeah. roof, yeah. yeah. Um, so um, yeah, so that's so you know I don't think there are that, that many um, uh, satanic. Dr. Mabuza types who are, yeah. you know, planning to take over the world and all that kind of thing. I think it's, I think it's more kind of um, um, striving for, for, to, for survival and to get enough um, cash that you feel secure, which is never enough. Yeah. That's, that, you know, that's the 1%. Yeah. Um, it gets dressed up as, uh, oh God, effective altruism now. Effective whereas... altruism, yeah. When you really make a billion, <laughs> then you can give away some money, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to save oh. bazillions of people in the future. God forbid I do anything in the, the present. To, you know, when, yeah. I was, when I was coming up as a, as a writer, going to college and afterwards, and thinking of myself as wanting to be a writer, um, we never thought about money. Yeah. We never expected money. It was not, it was not in the cards, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, we all had that idea, uh, like Sonny Rollins, that if he didn't think he was uh, playing well enough, he was going to go to the woodshed, it was called, you know. Um, he, would, he would play uh, on the Williamsburg Bridge. He would take his saxophone. So, you know, we all thought, we're just going to practice enough and we're going to get better. Not, we're going to make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that, that, that has certainly changed a lot, you know. Do you see that with writing students? Is there that sense that they think this is the key to to some financial success, or do they avoid writing because it's a financial non-starter? I think they think this is something they want to do, and that they're 
they're wrong and that they'll be punished, but yeah, they still that, want that, to do it. That's what I mean. That, yeah, you know, they, don't, they don't really think they're going to get rich from doing and, it. Yeah, they see it as an economic choice one yeah, way or the other. It was an economic choice. It was a bad economic choice, <laughs> but, you know, they're going to do it. Yeah. yeah. And, of course, now um, it's so expensive to go to graduate school, you know, so a lot of them are taking on uh, a lot of debt, you know. Yeah. I feel for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's one of those. <clears throat> I'm lucky enough to have been too cowardly to, to pursue the arts for oh. real. Instead, you know, doing this and having a a, a day career, uh, as as somebody put it. But um, yeah, that sense of I guess what you've seen from how decades of working with students, uh, you know, what what sort of perspective that gave you is something I've always been interested in. Given that they're reflecting themselves and the world through the sorts of essays that you're you're helping them with. Right, and yeah. and and you know. When I've taught them, I've tried to um, to bring in um, the past, which is the foundation, as I see it, uh, for this kind of writing. So, you know, you need to read um, Emerson, you know, you need to read Montaigne, Hazard, Lamb, and so on, um, instead of thinking that, uh, you know, all of this was invented in 2023. Yeah. Or treating the essay like it's a stand-up comedy bit, which... Yeah. This is just me going off on my rant. You don't have to endorse it. But, yeah, when I see occasional book well, of is, essays and it's, are, you know. there is There is a lot of um, crossover between the stand-up comedy shtick uh, and, 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 the, and the personal essay. I remember the first time I ever saw Spalding Gray in performance. Sure. And I thought, my God, that's the stuff I do. And this guy's getting paid a lot of money to do it. <laughs> <laughs> of course, he was a great performer. Yeah, it's a... There's a monologue I've been working on that allegedly I'll be doing at the the end of the year for that that uh, the week between Christmas and New Year's. I figure there's no point in putting a guest show. I'm actually going to have this this longer piece that I've I've written. It hasn't been written yet. Uh, there are notes for it, but um, the sense of performing your own work versus leaving it on the page has that ever been a I love to perform my work. Um, yeah, I just I, I mean, just gave readings, a, but but yeah. You yeah, know, I just gave a reading at um, politics and prose in, in oh, Washington yeah, D.C. Yeah. and um, I I have this this odd feeling of trust for big audiences. You know yeah. what I mean? Like I I trust them more than I trust individuals. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I like I like to I like to perform. My mother was an actress, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, and I've got some of that ham in me, you know. Yeah. So yes, I like to perform my work. Yeah. So more nervous about sitting around a table with me than than you know having a big audience. Is yes, that- <laughs> exactly. Who knows if I trust you? <laughs> oh, I, I would never expect anyone and to then, trust me. Just you know to and feel then comfortable. You said you were a Yankee fan, so I definitely don't I, trust. You. This is all part of protective coloration. I I born nineteen seventy one with parents who knew nothing about American culture, living in North Jersey. You can't cheer for the Mets in that era. Right. You know, so the Yankees were winning. You, you cheer for the Yankees. In my car, I still keep a gray-on-gray gray Toronto Blue Jays cap oh. just in case I need to blend in somewhere. Yeah. You can't if really you tell the, the logo. Exactly. Well, no, anywhere down here. People no. are going to look and they're going to, oh, the Blue Jays. Okay, whatever. Nobody hates the Blue Jays, so, you know, except for I the Phillies. I don't you hate know. the Yankees. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't really. When we were kids, we, we thought the Yankees were the capitalists. Yeah. And the Dodgers were the were the working class, and now of course you know, all of these all of these um, baseball players get millions of dollars. So when they talk about um, bringing their lunch pail to them and so on, it's so silly because they're all yeah. they're all basically millionaires, you know. Yeah. Um, and having a hedge fund bazillionaire for the owner of your team, you know, uh, also undercuts everything we we kind of build yes. as those identities of, of Stephen you know, Cohen, yeah. who our teams are, but. But yeah, very disappointing year for both of us. So you know, at least you know, right. we, we can commiserate. We can commiserate yes. Yeah, although everybody will still goof on the Yankees mm. for not making the playoffs. Finally, well, you know, last year I told I told Yankee fans I said, um, don't count the Astros out. They're a very good team because you know Yankee fans are very smug and they just think you know we'll roll over. They're everybody. just going to walk right yeah. in, you know. And of course, the Astros did took it all. Yeah, yeah. It's basically ever since two thousand. It's it's been pretty downhill. We had the one in two thousand nine, but it's no. it's. I understand. I, I'm willing to accept. Mm. We had our time. It was a great time, and no one has won three championships in a row since then. But it's okay. I'm I'm willing to to, you know, right. Let the Yankee thing slide a little bit. Um, but speaking about baseball and our our fragmented selves, tell me about the unitary self. The unitary self is basically, you know, that uh, um, 
This is who I am for better or worse. You yeah. Know? Um, and um, I mean, you're right near the end of the book in your your Montaigne. Yeah. Oh, not an homage, tribute. Well, uh, your your uh, reflection. Experience? Yeah. yeah. Um, about that sense of the unitary self versus that fragmentary. Why? Philip. Okay, so so you know in 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 critical theory, which invaded um, <laughs> yeah. English schools, um, there was this idea first of all that um, that the self was um, a fant a phantasm, um, and um, you know who knows if 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 one's self was real and so on, and it, we were just being uh, programmed by uh, by the media and and um, and I thought, yeah, yeah, you know, um, I sort of feel like I am a person, that I have a self, um, and um, when my when my when my wife says, "You think you're always right," I think, no, I absolutely do not think I'm always right, but I do think that I have a unitary self, which is a different story. Yeah, you know, one way or another, you know, um, uh, I am who I am. I'm not going to change very much. So that becomes a good foundation, a basis uh, from which to write personal essays. When you know that you're not that, that that you may be fluid, but you're not completely fluid. You know, yeah. you're basically um, going to return to a core of self. This, yeah, the foundation yeah. remains. This will get into my own experience, which I've talked about on the show a bunch of times, so people can just tune out. But before you, you got the good part of your diagnosis. Mm-hmm. Did yes. you think about the end? I definitely, I definitely thought about the end, um, and um, did you think of what you wanted to write? You know, I was so, I was so shocked because part of my sense of the unitary self um, was thinking of myself as, as, um, as strong and capable, and I was the one who. Um, my friends would often look to and lean on when they needed support, you know. So I thought, okay, I am Superman, you know. Yeah. And um, this kind of thing doesn't happen to me. And then, of course, it did happen to me. And, and in fact, um, a lot of people around me started getting very nervous, you know. Yeah. And, and I also had to decide, was I going to tell people? Sure. That became a big decision, you know, was I going to tell people? And for several months, I did not tell people, especially because... I was teaching, and you know, um, you don't tell the dean that you're um, yeah. capable of dying because they're going to start to take your courses away from you. <laughs> so, um, eventually, you know, um, I I began to uh, feel that it was going to work out. Um, but I would tell my daughter, you know, like, hey, you know, I can I can live for ten or fifteen more years with this. And, and, and she said, well, I'm going to go in to see your doctor because I think you're lying to me and trying to, you know, like, uh, um, make it sound better than it is. But she was much more upset than I was. Mm -hmm. um, so that was so that was all part of it. Um, yeah. What, what does it mean to think about? Um, I mean... I mean, my thing was the before the diagnosis. I had a 10 day stretch and I've talked about this on the show, but blah, blah, blah. Uh, 10 day stretch from you need to call this doctor to actually going to that first consult with no idea why they were sending me to an oncologist. I mean, I knew my white blood cell count was high, right. but I spent 10 days assuming I had six months left to live and, and that was it and assessing and what was the diagnosis? No, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. You're going to be fine 20 or 30 more years. There's all sorts of treatments, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, Okay, I, I kind well, of been preparing to die for the last ten days or the well, last fifty also, years, but yeah. we, you yeah. know, we we come. Uh, you know, I've been around long enough that um, before they had good treatments for cancer. Yeah, when can when when you were told you had cancer, that meant you're going to die. Right, simple as that. Um, so, so I kind of listened to the abyss a little and then stepped back because I got the the, the best bad news, as they put it. But it, you know, it lurks and, and lingers. I just wasn't sure from your perspective. Yeah, no, I how think, it's. Uh, I think about it. I mean, I think, I think, 
I, I play it in my mind. Like, for instance, um, I think about people who, who are dying, that they, um, that they start to feel so weak that they think, okay, just let it happen, you know? So they're lying there, you know, uh, maybe getting a morphine drip or whatever. Um, and so I think, well, if I were in, in that position, I wouldn't have much of a choice, and I would just think, okay, let it come, yeah. you know? Um, so I've always been fairly stoical, you know. Hmm. Um, you think Montaigne helped with that? Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> he helped her also. I was, I was there, and yeah, he confirmed. Yeah. Um, yeah, stoical. Uh, it's a position, um, and um, it's a position that actually makes me feel um, out of sync with the times because I don't think we're living in very stoical times. No. Um, so yeah. Uh, I did think about it, but a lot of times I try not to think about it. Yeah. Yeah, I found denial has been absolutely tremendous. Denial uh, is a good a, thing, yes, yeah. exactly. Um, so. But yeah, it's that, that whiplash, I guess. But I don't mean to, to dredge it up if it's something you're not, yeah, that you're in denial about right now or doing well with. Um, but yeah, there's just that sense of... I never really wanted to give that much thought to um, to my body or to taking care of my health, you know? Hmm. Like, I didn't want to think, oh, my God, I'm, I shouldn't eat that piece of pie or something like that. You know, I, I thought, oh, come on, you know. Yeah, had tennis, you yeah, know. You're, you're able to... That, still that playing tennis. Should yeah. be your barometer for how healthy you are. Yeah, yeah. still playing tennis. Still taking lessons. Um, so, yeah, still doing that. Um, but I didn't really want to think of... Um, I, I didn't want to give over my body to... I didn't want to give over my mind to um, thinking about um, sustaining myself health-wise. Yeah. I get you. You ever been to Montaigne's library? I have been to it, yes. It's, it's on my list of places I really should. I, I don't believe in the whole bucket list thing, but I do have this sense of... Uh... Okay, here's where Philip's daughter came by, so I have to cut out this part. Once she left, we had a little conversation about social media, why Philip doesn't use it, why my use has dwindled, and, uh, well, here we are. As each year goes by, I find there's less and less of myself. This is where I put myself out. Yeah. Um, when I was talking with Adam Sisman, the, the Le Carre guy, right. you talked about your your life's work and fulfilling your life's work. This is mine. And I didn't realize it when I started at 41. This isn't just a biographical project of the, the people I speak to. This is where my life comes out in little right. bits and pieces that, again, forensic psychologists life, might put yeah. together. Uh, they'll, mm. they'll start to say, hey, Gil actually said X, Y, and Z, but he didn't mean, you know. Um, but yeah, it's it's something I've come to understand, again, in the, the wake of the, ah, I might die someday. I should probably assess what I've done with my life. Yeah, and, and exactly. This has been the, professionally, I've done things that are, are valuable to the public health. You but, know, I mean, um, I this, should mention yeah. that um, recently I was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Oh, good, because I cross people. I, I, I have my whole spreadsheet of people who've been inducted so I can cross off people I've actually spoken yeah. to. So I'm glad I've got you on and, that. And I always thought that that was something that would never happen to me, Yeah, that that was for those other people. You know, um, who, you know, who met like a cabal and they all decided <laughs> and they said, don't, no, not look. Yeah. And then I got in, you know, and I did feel like um, it was a sort of summation. Yeah. That it was a crowning achievement that I could feel good about myself. So a lot of that feeling of, of, of uh, feeling good about myself has to do with having gotten into the American Academy. I've, I've been in the, I guess, the building the once building. For, for Sandy McClatchy's memorial right. back in 2018, 2019, 2018. Yeah. Um, and that was my first instance of, huh, I should see who's actually in the Academy of Arts and Letters. And right. loaded and thought, this is a list of people I would love to sit down and record conversations with. So, well, yeah. you know, so now I can say I've already, you know, made a dent. But, yeah, exactly. But yeah, that, that sense of fulfillment, um, I mean, you've, you've you've built something in the personal essay that I would say approximates a life, but you know creates a life uh, beyond just the one that you've lived. Right. So, um, and seeing this one, and seeing a year and a day, and how it captures 
not just you, but but that time, and not just the Trump aspect of that time, but the 2016ness overall. Right. It's a uh, you know, it's a heck of an achievement. And the idea that you were just knocking it out on a weekly basis, you know, just kills me. Um, it's the only <laughs> way I could have done it, you know. Yeah, yeah. Is it? Again, I guess I sort of asked, you know, how it influenced your writing afterwards. But did you find any aspects of that that taught you? Yeah, maybe I need to just go looser, or you know, not not be open ended about certain projects. Or were you always relatively good at at constraining things, building limits for you yourself? You know, I've often I I've often thought about um, uh, writing in a more casual way. Sometimes. You know, I would think, oh, you know, that the writing in my in my journals was was my truest writing. You know, I had that fantasy for a while, and then I went back to my early journals when I was eighteen, nineteen, twenty. And I, <laughs> Nobody I, should have to look at their own. I but... almost threw up. Really, I I couldn't bear it. I thought, no, I'm not going to work with this material. This is disgusting. <laughs> Unless you wanted to make a very self-mocking character, oh, that's, no, that's... not self-flagellating. Yes, yeah, that's that's bad. Yeah, and recently, um, I went to the Beinecke, uh, and they showed me some of my my letters, and and I started reading some of these letters that I had written, and again, I was completely appalled. You know, um, I thought, well, it's well written, but it's so awful, and I'm, then my perspective is so awful. You know, <laughs> it reminds me when I was in college. Well. Ten years after college, maybe twelve years, I bumped into a pal from my freshman year, um, who told me, you know, Gil, I still have this this stack of books in my house of things you told me to read back when when we were freshmen at right. Tulane, and you know, I, I, I haven't gotten to them, but I'm going to. I'm like, I just please don't tell me what they are. <laughs> Throw them out. I will give you a new list. I don't want to know what I told you yeah, was exactly. worth reading when because we were eighteen. Because in my adolescence, we. We, we we have a certain kind of taste, you know. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I've I've been keeping a log of every book I finished since starting yeah. college, every prose book, and uh, whew, it's it's tough going back to 1989 and and seeing. Whoa, well, some yeah. of that was assigned, but some of this was by choice, Gil, and you, you yeah yeah you, you didn't choose wisely. Um, but again, that, that's one of the things that I marvel over, not just this collection, but your work. That sense of chronicling a life not in a strict autobiographical sense yes. but you know finding those themes and the things that matter it's not memoir it's it's again yeah. something you've achieved with this that I, I I don't know how replicable it's like Caro and the the Lyndon Johnson thing we don't see the potential for this sort of thing I guess in this day and age well you know I, I I've often fantasized writing a memoir, writing an autobiography, instead of the, doing it this way, which is this, in this hunt and peck manner, you know? Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, I, th I thought, well, that's something that, that awaits me, you know? But, but what it would mean in a way, and, and this has always stopped me, is to figure out what, what is the theme of my life, you know? Yeah. Sort of like, well, what is the figure in the carpet, to quote that Henry James idea? Yeah. And, and, you know, I'm not sure I do know what the theme is. And so, you know, it would be hard to to structure it in that sense, you know. I think like Proust, the theme is the writing itself yeah. or the writer itself, as opposed to the, the, well, the everything else is what the writer has, has integrated in a way. I know it sounds basic, but I think you get what I mean in a more complex way. Yeah, that it's, easy it's, for Proust, maybe, you know. Yeah. Um, no, I mean so so yeah so so you could say that um, that I've taken this approach um, while waiting for the courage to do the other thing, or you could say that no, this is the way I see see things. You know, so you spoke about the 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 unitary self, but it it, it it's also in some ways a very a very fragmented self, and uh, and so this is the way that I that I. Uh, Pay homage to those fragmentations. Yeah. That's that's what I think I'm getting at. I think the unitary self is the writing. Yes, you know that that's the thing that lurks underneath it all. That that not attempt at organizing, but at finding how to make meaning out of the fragments. Not the God. It's a thing I wrote uh, almost two years ago now about. Ezra Pound and Donald Hall. Mm. Uh, I, I put it in that that zine that I, I sent you, that haiku for business travelers. That uh, the line that 
Pound gives when Hall shows up at his door for the interview where he says, you find me in fragments. Mm, you find me in fragments. And yeah. I, I think Hall took it as, you find me shattered. And yeah. I think Pound may have meant yeah. those pieces are the, where you're going to find me. Me, yeah. the, the real me that's underneath is the bits and pieces. But. Well, you know, uh, recently, you know, a friend was uh, paying me a compliment and said that I, I was a polymath and I knew all of these subjects like, um, you know, uh, architecture and literature and film and um, and jazz and so on and and I said to him I don't really feel like a polymath I don't really feel that that's accurate I don't really think that I am this um, you know this genius who knows all these areas I think that you know um, I lived a life uh, for the most part in New York City and that these things splashed against me and I learned what, what there was to learn you know um, without necessarily um, um, exerting too much uh, effort, you know. Um, like you stepped into the swirl. Yeah, I stepped into the swirl. And so that's, so, so that's why I'm interested in a lot of different things. But, you know, that doesn't seem, su that doesn't seem surprising to me. Yeah. Why shouldn't you be? You know, there's, there's all of this um, nourishment being put out, you know, in the museums, in the movie houses and so on. And so I'm going to take some of it, you know. Curiosity, like you said, that that's there is your unitary self, the, yeah. the curious soul. Right. I guess. So, last question: Who are you reading? Ah, well, or what well, are you reading? Well, uh, besides all the Washington Irving, uh, that I'm reading a lot mentioned. of Washington Irving because yeah. you know he he wrote. I have a I have a twenty volume set of his, um, and and he wrote these enormous biographies, like he wrote a biography of. Columbus that's a thousand pages long so Jeez. this is going to take me a while yeah okay and I'm also reading these books by um, by Van Wick Brooks you yeah. know um, so that you know and then friends send me um, you know or acquaintances uh, send me their books to write blurbs you know so I read those you know yeah. um, and um, let's see I read the uh, uh, a, a novel by George Gissing because I always like Gissing yeah. uh, um, called The Whirlpool um, so it's, it's, it's a little of this and a little of that you know it's always it's always different things um, yeah, beyond the blurbing thing do you feel a need or do you feel any any compulsion to, to read contemporary too much no I feel more and more like well I better read I better start reading um so Walter Scott, who I've never read, because yeah. Scott was a big fan of uh, of Irving, and I better read uh, James Fenimore Cooper because he didn't like Irving. <laughs> uh, so I want to know what was going on at that moment, you know. Um, uh, so as far as contemporary is concerned, um, you know, I'm always going to be um, not edgy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I yeah. sort of figured, but yeah, I didn't yeah. want to put it in those terms. I love, I love yeah. the idea. You know, I wrote, I recently wrote an essay um, about Robert Louis Stevenson's essays. Yeah. And the New York Review of Books is going to publish it. And um, again, I was drawing out things from my anthologies, you know, like, okay, I put in Robert Louis Stevenson, but here was a chance to write about all of his essays. So, you know, that, 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 was, a, that was an opportunity. Um, and, 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 going back to the past somehow, you know. So as far as contemporaries are concerned, um, I do read contemporaries. Um, you know, I keep I keep up with, you know, Maggie Nelson and Eula Biss and so on, you know, yeah. um, just because um, uh, that's what my students were reading and, I've, and I also felt, um, you know, curious about what, what was the big deal, yeah. you know. Um, so... You know, I read David Sedaris, but then sometimes he, uh, I, I find him tiresome, you know, and um, some of times it's great and sometimes it's not, you know. Right. Um, so uh, I, I, I read the contemporaries to some degree, yeah. uh, but probably um, for every book of a contemporary, I read three older writers. Mm -hmm. And you feel good about the canonical project yeah. of the great american essays yeah i, I feel very good about it um and uh, sort of a capstone yeah. to that part of your 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 life absolutely i feel i learned a lot i learned a lot doing it yeah. you know i filled in a lot of gaps mm -hmm. 
I learned a lot. I've got all three, and I, I always dip in periodically and realize if I went whole hog and tried to read all the way through it, it, it no. yeah, you defeat the purpose of, of just... I do. Why does, like, um, John J. Chapman and Raymond Byrne, or, you know, I just, Randolph Byrne, who I just didn't know before, you know? Yeah. So I, I, I filled in a lot of gaps, yeah. Philip, I'm looking forward to the Washington Irving. I'm hoping there'll be some collection before then, because it sounds like one of those projects right. where we're both going to be a bunch older by, by the time it, it comes right. through. But right. but thank you so much for this, and thank you for a year and a day, because, um, well, you know my thing. Any any writing of yours is a gift, so I'm, I'm glad to see 200 pages you know put together like this. So Thank you so much, and it was fun talking to you again. And that was Philip Lopate. His new collection, A Year and a Day, an experiment in essays from New York Review Books, is, is an absolute treasure. Go read it along with Philip's other essay collections and his reviews. And also pick up the three volumes of American essays he edited in the, the last few years, Great American Essays, uh, Golden Age, and Contemporary. Philip's essays, his his introductions to those collections, as well as to the, uh, the art of the personal essays, um, all that stuff comprises what I think is a huge contribution to, to our culture and to, to the writerly life. I think Philip is one of the most important writers around. And as I sort of got at, his career gives me a, a sort of North Star for what it is that I'm doing here. So uh, the upshot is he is not on social media anywhere. And in fact, even the philiplopate.com website is melted down. So um, you're not going to find him online. You're going to find him in books. You're going to find them in fragments, as we talk about. So go read Philip Lopate. Go get a year and a day. Now you can support the Virtual Memory Show by telling other people about it. Let them know there is this podcast comes out every week with fascinating conversations with interesting people. You can also help out the show by telling me what you like and don't like about it, or who you'd like to hear me record with, or what movie or TV show or book or piece of music or theater or art exhibition or essay collection or whatever you think I should turn listeners on to. You can do that by email, by DM, if we're connected on social media, uh, by postcard or letter. My mailing address is at the bottom of the Substack email that I send out twice a week. Uh, or by leaving a message on my Google Voice number, which is 973 Eight six nine nine six five nine. That goes directly to voicemail, so you don't have to worry about getting stuck in an awkward conversation with me. And messages can be up to three minutes long. So if you go longer than that, you'll get cut off. Just call back, leave another message. And uh, let me know if it'd be okay to include your message in an upcoming episode of the show. You might have something interesting to share with listeners, but I would never include something like that without the, the speaker's permission. So, uh, you know, let me know. If you've got money to spare... Don't give it to me. I mean, this show costs shit. Uh, I found street parking, so that wasn't a big deal. The tolls were probably about 30 bucks total, and then it was, you know, my Saturday spent driving around. But really, this is what I do for love. If you really want to give me some money, go subscribe to the Substack that I do and do the paid tier for 50 bucks a year. But really, don't. Uh, give money to other people who are really in need. Especially now as we're getting into the whole holiday season, Thanksgiving is next week. Uh, you know, I give to my local food bank every month. So, you know, maybe if you if you haven't done that, give to them before Thanksgiving. Try and, uh, you know, help them help somebody else. And when it comes to individuals, uh, you can find people through GoFundMe, Patreon, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, Crowdfunder, all of those crowdfunding platforms. And when you're there, you'll find people who need help with medical bills or, or rent or car payments or veterinary bills or, or getting an artistic project off the ground. And it's a really good use of your, your time and money to, to try to help other people like that. And with institutions, in addition to the, the uh, your food bank, you could give to the Poor People's Campaign, Freedom Funds, and, and Women's Choice, and Planned Parenthood, and and other funds and foundations that could use your help. Because, uh, you know, there are ways we could try to build a better world. And, uh, you know, I hope you'll take part in that. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. 
Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memories Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. Now you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading. Keep making art and keep the conversation going. <laughs> <laughs>